Well, here we are. Carl Gustav C.G. Jung and his magical, mysterious red book. I want to begin by thanking you for listening. The way forward begins with a quote by Isaiah, known most from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. But before we begin, we have to know the way in which this red book came to be. What is the red book, you may be asking? Carl Jung is a psychologist. Why did he write a book called The Red Book? Sounds a bit fictiony, if that's even an acceptable word in our times. Now I'm going to start with a bit of flair. This book is a book beyond what you would expect out of a book. To be honest, it's not even titled The Red Book. Rather, Liber Novus, Latin for the new book. It is a new book for a new time, or rather better put, a new age. This red book is a collected works that was handwritten with beautiful imagery and derived from Jung's personal experiment in the depths of his mind. And we're not talking about some fun little experiment. In Jung's own words, I quote, My entire life consisted in elaborating what had burst forth from the unconscious and flooded me like an enigmatic stream and threatened to break me. That was the stuff and material for more than one lifetime. We're going to be looking into this material, the stuff of more than one lifetime, which almost broke one of the greatest thinkers in recent times. Now this red book or new book was released in 2009. Carl Jung passed away in 1961. Almost 50 years after his death in this treasure, the stuff that provided Jung the framework for his analytical psychology is finally in the public eye. And you may be wondering, why wouldn't he release it in his lifetime? And if not, why did it take so long after his passing? Well, a quick story. Jung started this journey before any idea of a red book or any book. Rather, he recorded his experiments with his unconscious in his personal journals known as the Black Books. A side note is that these Black Books were just released last year. I have a copy, and they will play into a role throughout the series. So back to the story. In Jung's lifetime, he did drop a few hints to those close around him about this book. There's also a text going around during his lifetime named Septum Sermones Ad Mortos, or Seven Sermons to the Dead, which can be seen as a summary revelation of the Red Book experience. (laughs) Excuse my Latin here and throughout this series, although I may know this material and I've lived this material, I am self-taught with just access to the internet. In Jung's memories, dreams, and reflections, he's quoted saying, These conversations with the dead formed a kind of prelude to what I had to communicate to the world about the unconscious. And oh my, are we going to get more than a prelude throughout the series? Folks, this is a book beyond what you would ever think of as a book. This is an accredited and respected scientist exploring the unknown depths of consciousness. He knew people couldn't accept it in his time. It was too much to handle, so to say. A bit radical. It would have tarnished his scientific image more than it had already been. And this valuable information would never get the respect it was due. Although no official account is provided, one can see how Jung may have carefully organized this new book to be available when the time is ripe. And by gosh, is the time ever so ripe for this rather new information. I can continue on with amazing little facts about this book. For example, in alchemy, the initial stage of transformation is the blackening. And the final achievement is in the reddening, which provides the Philosopher's Stone. And his black journals led to the red Philosopher's Stone of a book. (laughs) but I'll leave all the goodies for you to discover. So sit back, 
and enjoy this philosophical, spiritual, psychological, religious, and mental journey through the depths of Carl Gustav Jung, a road where science truly meets spirituality. The new book begins in a rather ancient time with the words of the prophet Isaiah. This is followed by another three passages in the Bible, two more by Isaiah and one by John. I will read them, but as I read, I want you to think about the structuring of these texts, as well as the essence Jung is attempting to get across before he begins the way of what is to come. Isaiah said, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we shall desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. John said, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Isaiah said, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and bloom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons, where each lay, shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And a an highway shall be there, and a way and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. Written by C.G. Jung with his own hand in the year 1915. Jung begins the new red book in his own words, and I quote, if I speak in the spirit of this time, I must say, no one and nothing can justify what I must proclaim to you. He continues, I have learned that in addition to the spirit of the times, there's also another spirit at work, namely that which rules the depths of everything contemporary. Here, Jung is introducing us to two different spirits, the spirit of the times and the spirit of the depths. I want to keep focused off of my story and strictly on Jung, but I feel the need to share a little bit about my journey. I was searching for the truth in the world and found this spirit within the depths. I was not in any religion or spiritual practice, rather just exploring alone within my own self. As I did leave TV meteorology in this pursuit to explore, uncover, and disclose this inner truth, the Red Book helped provide the confidence to keep moving forward and helped me think that I wasn't going mad. And we'll be talking more about the subject of madness later on in the series. Now back to Jung. His situation is a whole different game than mine. He was at the top of his field, widely known and respected throughout the world. He left his pride behind and went alone into the unknown. He didn't have an example to help him along the way as those that took this path, like Friedrich Nietzsche, didn't fare so well. Jung had to push through, blinded in suspension, trusting where his unconscious space leads. 
against all, and I mean all, that he learned at this time. The amount of respect I and many others included have for this man's sacrifice is impossible to express. Jung remarks, the spirit of the times would like to hear of use and value, but that other spirit forces me, nevertheless, to speak beyond justification, use, and meaning. I think you're getting a feel of what happened to Jung. He was gripped by something and he could not repress nor deny it. He wanted to keep it away, but he continues, filled with human pride and blinded by the presumptuous spirit of the times, I long sought to hold that other spirit from me. He wasn't attempting to break new grounds within himself. He wasn't even trying to make contact with any other spirits. But as he says, I did not consider that the spirit of the depths from time immemorial and for all future possesses a greater power than the spirit of this time who changes with the generations. Here I have to pause. Really think about this. The spirit of the depths overpowered the spirit of the times, piercing through its attractive mirage. As the times continues to change its image or manifestation, the underlying essence remains in primary force, unchanging. That is why the depths are more powerful than the times. The depths provides the essence to form. Now Jung was in a difficult position with all the material which births forth. And he was not one to just leave a thing aside. His curiosity gave him an ear to this unknown inner voice. And from this point forward, Jung becomes Jung. He remarks, Everything later was merely the outer classification, the scientific elaboration, and the integration into life. But the numinous beginning, which contained everything, was then. This is that then, the moment Jung came in contact with the spirit of the depths. I think it would help to split these two spirits apart and expand on their nature. The spirit of the times can be seen as culture of today. It is also seen in a scientific, reasonable light. The spirit of the times believes in judgment, accomplishment, and order. My favorite analogy to use is that of an ego or subjective consciousness, meaning a personal, changing secondary spirit to the primary causes of things. This primary cause will be known as the spirit of the depths, an objective, non-judgmental spirit that can be better described as what is rather than the measurement of judgment filled in by the spirit of the times. The depths are chaotic, while the times are orderly. The depths are expansive and infinite, and the times are limited and finite. The depths are unchanging from time immemorial, whereas the times are always in flux. You see the two spirits are rather opposites, one light, the other dark. The times are seen, visible and conscious, and the depths are unseen, invisible, unconscious. In my final analogy, the spirits of the times is to science as the spirit of the depths is to spirituality. The depths needs the times to order it. The times needs the depths to fill it. And if you could see that relationship, you could see why both are necessary and needed. They're both important to each other as a whole, even though one, the depths, is more powerful. Psychologically, a great way to see the spirit of the times and the spirit of the depths is between the ego and the self. The spirit of the times, always changing. Judgment, that's the ego. That's our subjective consciousness. That's I am, I feel, thinking. That's all ego. The self is the objective, the totality of everything we are. So imagine the ego waking up in the morning, living its day, and then all of a sudden emotions run up. What's setting that off is the depths. And if the ego is unaware of it, it misses it. Now, if that subjective consciousness is looking towards it, well, then it grows. 
This is what Jung is pointing us toward. If the spirit of the times or the ego is off center, off balance of the spirit of the depths or the self, then psychologically there can be issues. If the ego is connected to the self, if the spirit of the times is measuring the depths with a correct mark, again, growth is possible. In between the two, both figuratively and literally, was Jung. You can feel him, see him, suspended and being pulled in opposite directions by these spirits. The image of Jung being stretched out in the middle of these two opposing forces makes sense in his nonsense. And here we arrive at the supreme meaning. Jung was stripped away from all his reason. As he writes in the Red Book, the spirit of the depths has subjugated all pride and arrogance to the power of judgment. He took away my belief in science. He robbed me of the joy of explaining and ordering things. And he let devotion to the ideas of this time die out in me. Continuing. He robbed me of speech and writing for everything that was not in his service, namely the melting together of sense and nonsense, which produces the supreme meaning. This theme of uniting opposites into wholeness is the running theme throughout Jung's work, and you see its importance as we just went through that of uniting both the times and the depths. Before we uncover the supreme meaning, one needs to ponder the previous quote. Jung's ego was in a state of suspension. He mentioned he was robbed twice, unable to add his opinion to the matter. Rather, something was speaking to him, in him, through him. There was something truly alive within Jung, and he couldn't escape its supreme meaning. He writes, The supreme meaning is the path, the way, and the bridge of what is to come. God is an image, and those who worship God must worship the image of the supreme meaning. Now, what is the supreme meaning? From Jung's depths, I quote, The supreme meaning is not a meaning and not an absurdity. It is an image and force in one. Image and force in one. A primary force manifesting a secondary image. I continue. It, that is the supreme meaning, is the beginning and the end. It is the bridge of going across and fulfillment. Now you may notice why I included the Bible text to start. Everything has its purpose with Jung. And if you have a keen eye, you'll begin to connect everything into one big aha moment. So this meaning is a bit confusing to say the least. You may have picked up on this subtle truth about the supreme meaning Jung is hinting at. If not yet, you may be in the position Jung was in as the spirit of the times, rather his ego consciousness, was attempting to explain away the supreme meaning. The spirit of the depths, though, did not let this slide, forcing its bitter drink between Jung's lips. Earlier, I quoted Jung saying, God is an image, and those who worship God must worship the image of the supreme meaning. Here's the first bomb set off by Jung in the Red Book. One that caused him to keep this book secret throughout his entire life, although all he is known by is derived from these discoveries. Put yourself in this man's shoes. Here he is, alone with his psyche, realizing it may be an it, rather than a dead machine. Why do I say this? Well, he's saying that if you worship a god, whether it be Yahweh, Jesus, Buddha, whoever, you must worship the image of the supreme meaning. This supreme meaning, according to Jung, is the same as any godhead. What is the essence of the supreme meaning, or God, image and force, or symbol and energy? Jung, the scientist, is making a statement about God, and he's not claiming God is dead, rather alive, and makes itself known in a force and image within all. A beautiful illustration of this idea is provided by the French philosopher Voltaire, who wrote, God is a circle whose center is everywhere and circumference is nowhere. Talk about the paradoxical blend of the essence of the supreme meaning, which is the blending of sense and nonsense. 
This is something to really think about. Jung says the other gods died of their temporality, yet the supreme meaning never dies. Jung is attempting to direct us to the fact that there is a meaning underlying all the different temporal changing godheads of the time. There is a true spirit metaphysically within this image, and it has a force behind it. This is not something you hear nor think about every day, especially in our materialistic society. I do advise one to really work through this. While the remainder of the series will help order some of the chaos, one does well to do a bit of mental yoga with some of these concepts. Just some humble advice. So the supreme meaning is now in the hands of the times and the depths. Their battle continues. After the idea of the supreme meaning comes up from the depths, the times responds. It wanted Jung to recognize the greatness and extent of the supreme meaning, but not its littleness. The depths whipped back at Jung as he says, Conquering this arrogance, and I had to swallow the small as a means of healing the immoral in me. The spirit of the times whispered back, and again I repeat, whispers back, this supreme meaning, this image of God, this melting together of the hot and cold, that is you and only you. But the depths replied, you are an image of the unending world. All the last mysteries of becoming and passing away live in you. If you did not possess all this, how could you know? And real quick, just think about when an intuition hits you. How could you know? Another pause is required. First, the Times gives us a beautiful clue about this supreme meaning. Wholeness is its nature, as it is blending the hot and the cold, or the earlier definition of blending the sense and nonsense. This paradoxical, whole, forceful image is our supreme meaning. Secondly, the Times claims this meaning is you and only you. This is important as the times cannot see outside its time. It cannot see the other. In psychological terms, the ego cannot see the self. The depths replies, all the mysteries live in you. Have you ever heard of the statement that all is within you? The depths is claiming all the mysteries of becoming and passing away live in us. Claiming if you didn't have it in you, how could you know? Have you ever had a moment when you knew something without knowing it? Well, this is exactly what the depths are pointing Jung toward. The depths continues to push Jung. What you speak is, the greatness is, the intoxication is, the undignified, the sick, the poultry dailiness is. One laughs about it and laughter too is. Do you believe me, man of this time, that laughter is lower than worship? Where is your measure, false measurer? Earlier we discussed the times and depths, going into the fact that the depths are primary and the times are secondary, ordering to that chaos. If the ordering is off, you can see this idea about measuring coming into place. Also the word measure has a footnote after it, stating that this word in German carries a connotation of the adjective vermessen. Again, you know, I'm trying my best here. <laughs> but this word is a lack or a loss of measure and thus implies overconfidence. What this means is if one is overcomfortable, overconfident, extroverted, they'll lose their inner measure. Without the right measure, one is living an illusion, disconnected from the primary cause of reality, missing out on the reality of this experience. The depths continues. The sum of life decides in laughter and in worship, not in your judgment. Again, the depths wants Jung to see that his entire state of being has been the wrong measure. He has missed the mark, so to say. And it is wise to note that it decides, and our judgment is meaningless. Judgment distorts the supreme. Now the times, just as your own thinking, had to bark back at these statements. It said to Jung, what solitude? What coldness of desolation you lay upon me when you speak such. Reflect on the destruction of being and the streams of blood from the terrible sacrifice that the depths demand. 
The Times knew what these words from the dark, deep depths meant, and it wanted nothing to do with it. It's completely against its nature. Especially in Jung, the famous worldwide known Swiss psychologist who was feeding the spirit of the times, the ego consciousness, with all the lovely recognition and value it can strive for. Yet again, and now for the last time, the depths response. No one can or should hold to sacrifice. Sacrifice is not destructive. Sacrifice is the foundation stone of what is to come. Have you not had monasteries? Have not countless thousands gone into the desert? You should carry the monastery in yourself. The desert is within you. The desert calls you and draws you back. And if you were fettered to the world of this time with iron, the call of the desert would break all chains. Truly, I prepare you for solitude. So what's the theme? It's the melting together of the spirit of the time, which is your subjective consciousness, with the spirit of the depths, which is your unconscious consciousness. And that unconscious consciousness is the more powerful because it is the essence of all. It is the force behind an image, behind a thought. And from this personal psychological responsibility, if taken, one finds the supreme meaning. The supreme meaning is both the smallest and the largest. It's the melting together of the depths and the times. It's a connection of the ego and the self uniting and growing together towards wholeness. The melting together of the sense and nonsense is the melting together of image and force. Image can be derived from various factors, whether that be a dream, a trigger, a forethought, an intuition, is something that's important. Yet if you start paying attention, you could start to heal yourself. Jung is saying that there's a relationship that's important between the conscious and the unconscious, between the ego and the self, between the times and the depths. And if they're in alignment, if they're connected, then conscious growth proceeds. If they're not in alignment, if the ego has complete dependence and lost its conscious functioning, I'm not going to go any further, but you wonder about all the mental health issues, and you wonder about the supreme meaning, and you wonder about our responsibility to take care of our personal psychology by putting an eye toward the depths. After this major statement about the desert and solitude, Jung says his humanity went silent. I quote, Something happened to my spirit, however, which I must call mercy. My speech is imperfect, not because I want to shine with words, but out of the impossibility of finding those words. I speak in images. With nothing else can I express the words of the depths. This is powerful, powerful material. Those with ears will hear. If you've lived this, you will feel young. You cannot speak this way about this content. It must be lived, and it truly was lived. Now, we can't continue unless I say a thing or two about mercy. Mercy is defined as compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. Jung, the scientist who confronted the depths of his mind, said it is mercy which did something to his spirit. This is something you cannot buy, you cannot find, you cannot seek. It just happens. And such is the nature of the unconscious. We could all use a nod of forgiveness here and there. We all make our mistakes, judge, miss the mark. Now put some thought into this. Out of nowhere, the unconscious depths provides mercy. And if one's eye is keen to it, is open to it, is aware of it, something may happen. 
Jung speaks directly on this mercy. I quote, The mercy which happened to me gave me belief, hope, and sufficient daring to not resist the spirit of the depths, but to utter his word. Listen to these words again. Not to resist, but utter his word. I'll just leave that for you to ponder. The kicker is, the mercy is what gave him the faith to jump in the abyss. Again alone, with the reminder that one who had similar experiences with the unconscious, that is, Friedrich Nietzsche, suffered deeply because of this confrontation. One wonders how this mercy manifests in Jung's life. It must have been a tremendous experience. In my journey, this mercy is something that can't be explained. Again, it just happens outside of ego awareness. It happens from a beyond, and if I say anything more, my judgments will distort any truth in the matter. Now, even after this experience, the mercy, the depths calling him, Jung needed a visible sign, and this is where the magic begins. Jung writes, but before I could pull myself together to really do it, I needed a visible sign that would show me that the spirit of the depths in me was at the same time the ruler of the depths of world affairs. Jung received this sign. He was silenced, truly humbled by what he was experiencing and witnessing. He continues, it happened in October of the year 1913 as I was leaving for a journey that during the day I was suddenly overcome in broad daylight by a vision. We'll get to this vision, but remember the earlier words, the supreme meaning, God, is image and force. This is a clear cut example of the supreme meaning. This vision was one that startled Jung, as he says, I thought my mind had gone crazy. The vision, Jung writes, I saw a terrible flood that covered all the northern and low-lying lands of the North Sea and the Alps. It reached England up to Russia, and from the coast of the North Sea right up to the Alps, I saw yellow waves, swimming rubble, and the death of countless thousands. His depth spoke to him and said, look at it. It is completely real and it will come to pass. By gosh, did it come to pass. Eight months later, World War I begins. Millions, not thousands, died. It became reality and Jung was left staring back at what was within him just a few months prior. Just imagine this. Your inner depths say an image of countless dying is real and will pass, and then it does. Jung, speaking on these dreams outside the Red Book text, said, It was the beginning of a conviction that the unconscious did not consist of inert material only, but that there was something living down there. It's easy to play the spiritual game, do a little yoga, play with some cards and some rocks, meditate on positive vibes only. But you see, things start to change when you're faced with the living spirit of life. There's no room for an inflation, but rather a deep humbling that only true inner strength can proceed. This stuff we're getting into has no positive vibes about it. It is a true whole vibe of what is. Now this first chapter ends in a rather direct fashion. I'm gonna end this conclusion verbatim before we refine the soul with Jung in the next lecture. Now this lecture series is about Jung's journey into the unconscious and the revelations he provides from the experience. He does not, and I repeat, not want us to follow him. Rather follow our own depths, our own way within our own self. The following lectures will provide keys to taking this individual journey, but it is wise to take heed to the conclusion of this powerful beginning chapter. Jung concludes, Believe me, it is no teaching and no instruction that I give you. On what basis shall I presume to teach you? I give you news of the way of this man, but not of your own way. My path is not your path. Therefore, I cannot teach you. The way is within us, but not in gods, nor in teachings, nor in laws. Within us is the way, the truth, and the life. Woe betide those who live by the way of examples. Life is not with them. If you live according to an example, you thus live the life of that example. But who should live your own life if it is not yourself? So live yourselves. The signposts have fallen 
unblazed trails lie before us. Do not be greedy to gobble up the fruits of foreign fields. Do you not know that you yourselves are the fertile acre which bears everything that avails you? Yet who today knows this? Who knows the way to the eternally fruitful climes of the soul? You seek the way through mere appearances. You study books and give ears to all kinds of opinion. What good is all that? There is only one way, and that is your way. You seek the path, I warn you away from my own. It can also be the wrong way for you. May each go his own way. I will be no savior, no lawgiver, no master teacher unto you. You are no longer little children. One should not turn people into sheep, but rather sheep into people. Giving laws, bettering, making things easier has all become wrong and evil. May each one seek out his own way. The way leads to mutual love and community. and Men will come to see and feel the similarity and commonality of their ways. Laws and teachings held in common compel people to solitude so that they may escape the pressure of undesirable contact. But solitude makes people hostile and venomous. Therefore, give people dignity and let each of them stand apart so that each may find his own fellowship and love it. Power stands against power, contempt against contempt, love against love. Give humanity dignity and trust that life will find the better way. The one eye of the Godhead is blind. The one ear of the Godhead is deaf. The order of its being is crossed by chaos. So be patient with the crippledness of the world and do not overvalue its consummate beauty. This is all, my dear friends, that I can tell you about the grounds and aims of my message, which I am burdened with like the patient donkey with a heavy load. He is glad to put it down.